Good morning and welcome to Foothills Church. We are so excited to have you joining us and today I am especially excited because uh, we have some special guests and since usually it's just me and Becca here, anybody who comes in is a special guest. Uh, but today we have even more special guests because our worship is actually going to be live today. We have special guest Ben Aidy joining us. Tina is still uh, taking some time off this week. And so we have live musicians here. And if you've been at Foothills uh, for a while, you may remember Erin Latham. She is going to be joining us later on in the service. So stay tuned for that. I wanted to just say thank you to everybody who participated in our collection of items for the COVID group home. Those were dropped off last week and we had so many items, so many great things. Uh, we got some feedback that the group home was so excited and thrilled. We learned that the kids are actually uh, having to stay in their rooms in the group home so they can't even come out and mix with each other. So you guys gave them so many toys, games, art supplies, and uh, so that can keep them entertained while they're there. Thank you all so much for that. And now as we begin worship, go ahead and light a candle, set your space. We will be sharing communion later on, so prepare your elements. And if you're joining us on Facebook Live, check in on the comments. Let us know that you are here. And now please join us for passing of the peace. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Well, hello, my name is Ben. So great to be here with you. Man, will you just enter into worship with us? We're gonna sing some songs and I just wanna invite you uh, to sing along. So hopefully you know these ones, it'll be fun. <laughs> Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. On the while we're playing, come set our hearts ablaze with hope. Wildfire in our very soul. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. Darkness. 
the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand, fill our streets and lands. Set your church on fire, win this nation back. Change the atmosphere, build your kingdom here, we pray. Let us pray. Lord, send your spirit in this place. Renew our hearts in this time of worship so that we are better prepared to meet you and everyone, neighbor or stranger. Open our ears that we might hear your voice in even the most unlikely places. Open our eyes so that we can see you at work in everything around us. Let creation sing, and let us join our voices in wonder. Let your prophets speak, and let us be transformed by their word. Show us to the mountaintop again, O Lord. Even when we are far apart, draw us together in one spirit of love. Even when we feel isolated, make us a true community of faith, bearing witness to your grace and mercy in all that we do. Lord, send your spirit in this place. Wherever we are gathered, you are here. And where you are, this is holy ground. Amen. Good morning, Foothills. It is so good to be with you in worship this morning, however remotely. So hello from Kentucky, and I want to show you something. There is a little piece of Arizona here on my Kentucky back deck because of this wonderful gift I got uh, from Foothills before I left a few years ago. So just wanted to show you that and uh, sometimes these days when I am filming things for worship uh, services across the country you'll hear those little bells go off in the background and it is always a joyful sound to me. Bursting inside us, we cannot contain your love. Will surely come and find us like blazing wildfire, singing your name. God of mercy, sweet love of mine.
his sheep in a hot, dry desert, suddenly saw a very strange sight. Flames of fire came from a bush, but the bush did not burn up. Moses squinted his eyes. He looked around the bush one way, and then he looked around the bush another way. Moses, Moses, said a loud voice. Moses was scared. Here I am. Here I am, he said. Take off your shoes, said the, said the voice thundering. The place is where you're standing is holy ground. Moses kicked off his sandals, keeping his eyes on the flaming bush. I am the God of your fires, the voice said. Moses in his face, he was afraid to look at God. I heard my people crying in Egypt. God said, People are hurting and I come to save them. Now, oh, thought Moses, how will God do this? Go! Said God, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to ask him to let my people go. Me, said Moses, who am I going to go to Pharaoh? Who am I going to lead your people? He threw himself down onto the ground before God, but he kept one eye on the burning bush. I will be with you, said God. God said. Moses trusted God. He was willing to do everything God said. God gave Moses the words and power he needed to talk to Pharaoh and lead the people out of Egypt. Have you ever saw a burning bush? I haven't. But have you? Um, have you ever heard God's voice? I didn't, but I wish I did. Tell me in the comments.
He's my soul, my Savior, God, too. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior, God, too. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. And when I think that God is Son, not sparing, sent Him to die, I scarce can take it. That on the cross, my burden gladly bears. My soul, my Savior, God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior, God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Join me in a prayer, and as we lift our voices together in prayer, go ahead and put your prayer concerns and your joys in the comments. Loving God, as I start to pray, there are so many things in this world that need prayer. There are so many crises happening all over the globe, and you know what they are hurricanes, and violence, and racism, and unrest, and things happening throughout the world. You know those things. But this morning, I'm also reminded of all of the beautiful things that we sometimes miss. And I praise you for music, which is your gift to us. And I praise you that this morning we can share in that life. I praise you for the rain. I praise you for a day of under 100 degrees. I praise you for your creation that is still beautiful. I praise you that you are still holy. You are still present. You are still faithful. And you are still in control. And as we join together lifting our concerns to you, I know that you are concerned, and you are caring, and you are faithful. And so this morning, Lord, we confess to you that we trust you. We have faith in you, and we love you. Amen. Together, let's join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. So I was able to look at the comments real fast and um, saw all the praise, both for um, being able to have wonderful worship music this morning, um, but also for the children's moment and um, having Aaron with us already helping lead worship. So if you've been paying attention, you may have already started to notice the theme for the sermon. This morning we are in the book of Exodus and particularly the story of the burning bush. Um, but I want to go ahead and move back to chapter one and two to do a quick overview because there's some things that happen early on that um, have an impact on the passage we'll hear late in just a moment. So there's only been two chapters before this, but a lot is packed in there. The story of Exodus begins where the people of God have been living in Egypt for generations. 
And they've been living there as slaves, forced to work by Pharaoh and the Egyptians. They are growing in number, and Pharaoh and the others in power start to get worried and concerned that they could potentially have an uprising. So there's this mandate that goes out that all the Hebrew boys must be killed. we got to stop this and not be um, have potential to have this uprising. And so many of us know from our childhood or from other places the story of Moses as a baby, how his mother hid him for three months, but um, after three months she couldn't hide him any longer in her home, so she put him in a papyrus basket and put him in the Nile River along some reeds where Pharaoh's daughter found him. And um, Ma- Moses' mother was recruited to actually nurse him, so she continued to have that relationship But after that, he went to go live with the royal family, with Pharaoh's family, even though he was a Hebrew. And we know that he knows he was a Hebrew because as he got older, it says he witnessed how the Egyptians were treating the Hebrews, his people, and he grew very angry. So angry that he actually killed an Egyptian, Um, but he covered it up. But then later he saw two Hebrews fighting, and he went to go break it up. And this is the part that I find interesting for how it'll impact our passage this morning. He goes to those two Hebrew people, men, and they're like, who do you think you are? Who gives you the right to interfere in what we're doing? And they say, we know what you did to that Egyptian. And he realizes his secret's out. And so he flees for his life and he crosses the Red Sea and goes into Midian where he settles down as Um, now looking after some sheep, and marries a woman. Um, But let us listen for the word of God this morning from um, Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight, and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Come no closer, remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, and the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. So come. I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, who, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. I 
would like to take credit for, if you notice behind me, the red and orange yellow decor to match the theme of the burning bush. But that wouldn't be very honest, because if you've been paying attention and you've been joining us for worship for quite a while during this time of social distancing, you may have noticed that this has been left up ever since Pentecost. Um, and normally, Pentecost is um, one day, and we'll change out how our chancel is decorated based on the Christian seasons. And of all the seasons, Pentecost only lasts for one day. And so the red is only up there for one Sunday. Not this year. And um, I don't really have a reason for it other than that I just kept forgetting to change it. And normally there's other people that change it and we just let it be. Um, but it's a reminder that fire shows up in different places throughout scripture. Sometimes fire is associated with destruction or torture. Um, when I think of fire, I get a little nervous and think about the capacity it does have for destruction. But in two of our songs this morning, um, the image of fire came up, and both of them were used to highlight a characteristic of God and God's love for us. One song said, like wildfires in our soul. And the other one says, our love is like blazing wildfires. That God's love is so powerful and so immense. Such a magnitude. Through scripture, we also know that fire is a refining fire sometimes. Just the way um, silver and gold is purified through fire, it is through the process of fire that can actually lead to clarity. Fire also, for me, um, this week has come to um, be associated with the importance of resiliency. And in our story this morning, there's that image of the bush that Moses grabs Moses' attention. It says the bush was burning, it was blazing, but it was not consumed. Many of us have been paying attention to the many wildfires in California. This year has been a record-breaking year. Last year, um, there were over 5,000 fires that destroyed 56,000 acres. And as of last week, there's already been over 7,000 fires destroying one and a half million acres. And a lot of attention has been focused on up in Northern California, the Big Basin wet Redwood area. A lot of people have been very concerned because these redwoods are so treasured and they have been here for thousands of years. But this fire has also shown us resiliency. So even though in that Big Basin area, homes are gone and buildings are destroyed, things that will never get back that will have to be rebuilt instead, these huge redwoods, the trees that grow to be the tallest trees in the world, they look like charcoal sticks. But scientists have discovered and know that they are resilient and they are not quite dead, not in the least. In fact, it's not that they're just going to start growing like a decade from now. They say by next season, you can see new growth on these, these historic and monumental redwoods. God's love for us is resilient and steadfast, a love that burns up a bush but never consumes it. This morning, Moses is met by God and is startled, but then it, throughout this conversation he has with this voice, he finds out that God has been paying attention and hearing the cries of the Israelites, the cries of the Hebrew people, crying out for justice, for liberation. And God is calling Moses to be a co-worker with God to bring about this liberation. It doesn't take too long, though, for Moses to start to voice his hesitancies and to start voice his concerns. After verse 15, he starts to say, who am I? This is the same thing he said last chapter when those two Hebrews told him, who are you to come break up our fight? Maybe this is a narrative Moses has carried with him. Who is he? He doesn't have any authority. He has no power. He's been living his life with Pharaoh in the royal family. His life is so disconnected from the average Hebrew. 
Why him, out of all these people, would he be called to be this co-laborer with God, to bring about this transformation and this liberation? But sometimes our obstacles and the things that we um, see as things that we're hesitant to say yes to, because we see them as our weakness, can actually be some of our greatest strengths. This week, I um, listened to a podcast, um, so I feel like this is a commercial for Radio Lab. But um, if you want to hear the full story, f- check out Radio Lab on the episode "The Wooby Effect." And the reason it caught my attention was because um, it's about the ch- Chinese characters. And my daughters they, um, are learning Mandarin in school, and it talks about how um, back when computers first came on the scene, and especially in the 70s, um, we have a keyboard that fits all 26 letters of our alphabet, but have you ever wondered how a language like Chinese that has over 70,000 characters, how they're able to make it possible to fit onto a keyboard? Well, this was a huge puzzle for engineers um, when the computers started coming on the scene. And in fact, so many people started making these Um, predictions that China would have to just kind of forgo their language because their language was just too cumbersome, too many characters. There's no way um, that this is going to allow them to thrive in a technological age. So many people were campaigning for introducing other languages and knowing that their language is going to die off. But that's not the end of the story. In this story in the scripture, when Moses is telling God all the reasons why he shouldn't be called in this way, one of the reasons he says is because he has a stutter. He has a problem with public speaking. And um, for the longest time, I always associated, like, saw myself in Moses because um, I became a preacher, and if you would have told me that years before, I would have never believed you because public speaking is not my natural gift. But I recently heard our regional minister, Jay, share a story about Pedro, who was a pastor in Tucson, a disciples pastor at Desert Dove. When reading this text through the lens of an immigrant experience, he noticed perhaps Moses' difficulty with speaking and stuttering isn't one in terms of um, one that I have, but instead one about a barrier of language. God is talking to him in Hebrew, and he grew up in Pharaoh's palace. He's more familiar with Egyptian, perhaps, than Hebrew. And so he saw that as a stumbling block to being called as a leader and being called to give this message of God to all these Hebrew people. Surely a Hebrew would be more qualified for that. But it also echoes all of his insecurities he has and the distance he feels to his home land and his home people who are part of his family. The story doesn't end um, in the 70s with China deciding to forgo their language. We know now that it's still very much um, alive and thriving and um, over a billion people speak Chinese. And China is showing to be leading in terms of so many technological fronts on 5G, on all these other things. I'm not a technical person, so someone else will have to explain that. But back in the 70s, a guy by the name of Wang Yangmin decided to go um, develop a project where he took 70,000 characters of the Chinese language and with a team of students started to dissect every single character. And noticing all the characters and how some of them have similar brush strokes. So they they took every character and divided it up into certain brush strokes. And then they had a room with thousands upon thousands upon thousands of note cards with all of these strokes and categories where they put them together. And then they had to do it again and again. But eventually, they whittled it down to how every Chinese character was part of a certain amount of strokes and arranged the keyboard so that every character you could type by only having to press three or four keys. Um, And this was a humongous achievement and it allowed the Chinese language to continue in this technological era. And because they had this obstacle to their language, 
they actually started to develop things faster than the other parts of the world did. So I don't know about you, but I've been noticing now every year predictive text gets uh, more and more developed. So like when I'm writing an email, it'll just tell me what, it'll be guessing what they think I'm going to say next. Well, because in the 70s with this wooby way of typing, um, and because it was so cumbersome, in China they developed predictive text and they were using it back in the 80s. As, along with other things, they, this obstacle forced them to come up with these advances way before other places did. And so now they are thriving and um, doing very well in the technological side of things um, and leading the way. And it's their obstacle that looked like they were headed for death of a language that actually positioned them for strength. God is steadfast. Our obstacles are our strength. So whether it's in the world of linguistics, when an ancient language that seems too complicated and cumbersome to survive, God's love and God's promises for us are steadfast. Or like the world of nature, where scorched redwoods that are thousands of years old seem like they have no life in them, but they will too sprout new life. Or back with the Hebrew people when, when Moses was a baby and it looked like the Hebrew people were in just not headed to any kind of hope whatsoever. All of the boy babies were being killed. A generation later, they're going to leave Egypt through the leadership of Moses and find freedom on the other side of the Red Sea. God promises Moses, with everything he comes to God with of why he shouldn't be called, God promises to be steadfast and to never abandon him and to never leave him. For God is a God of liberation. And I believe God calls all of us as co-laborers, as co-workers in this work of liberation. Today, there are voices crying out. Can you hear them? There are voices of pain, wailing, saying, not again, no more. This oppression has lasted for too long. White supremacy has had too strong of a hold. Death and violence and um, oppression has been here with us so long. But God hears these cries. And God is calling out to you and to I, to be a co-worker for this movement of liberation. And maybe when you hear these voices crying out, maybe you're like Moses and you can list all of these reasons why you are not particularly called to do that work. But God comes to us and promises, just like God promises to Moses, those promises are for us, that God's love will be steadfast and that God's presence will be always with us. Thanks be to God. Amen. Jesus asked, what is the kingdom of heaven like? The kingdom of heaven is a tiny seed that grows wild, giving shelter and shade to every living thing in the garden. The kingdom of God is yeast. It starts small and rises, making enough bread to feed the neighborhood. The kingdom of heaven is a generous church lady who doesn't have much, but gives everything she has so others might live. The kingdom of heaven is a great banquet where those who were on the outside have been gathered in, where there is plenty to pass around, where there is room for everyone at the table. We come to this table knowing that many in our world go hungry, 
even there, though there is enough. Many live in need, even th though creation is filled with the abundance of God. Jesus has many stories and beautiful images to show us what the kingdom of heaven is like, but they all point to the same truth. The kingdom is abundance, and the way of Christ is love. When Jesus asks what the kingdom of heaven is like, he is not just pointing to a truth for us to know. He is giving us tools to build this place of abundance, to bring this way of love into reality, to share what we have with those in need until none are left empty. When we gather at this table, we remember the many ways and places where we have witnessed that abundance, love, and life in our own time. As we gather together, we remember that on the night he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the meal, he took the cup, and he said, this is my blood, poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so whenever we do this, when we eat and drink and share together, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Will you pray with me? God, we give you thanks that in you there is life, and in the way of Jesus there is more than enough. Bless this bread and this cup to be signs of your presence among us. As we share this feast, make us mindful of those who hunger and thirst. Fill us with your spirit of compassion that we may grow to feed the whole world, bringing your kingdom about in our time. In your name we pray. Amen. technology just amazing that a screen this small will let me worship with you from three time zones away. How many small things can you think of that have miraculous potential? How about a child or a tiny mustard seed or any gift given in love? How about a small spark that becomes an amazing campfire to make the perfect s'mores, or even a burning bush to speak God's word. Most great things start as small things. 
and small things, when transformed in the spirit, have tremendous impact in the world. The COVID-19 crisis has created many big problems. People are hungry here at home and around the world. People are sick, people are feeling isolated, and people are still impacted by other disasters, like the fires in California, the hurricanes in Louisiana and Texas, the explosion in Beirut, and a growing refugee crisis around the world. In all of those places, responding to critical needs is even more challenging because of the pandemic. Travel is restricted. You can't house too many people in one shelter. That's just not an option. And the economic impact of a disaster is twice as heavy now. The challenges just go on and on. And the need seems overwhelming. But when we give out of compassion, what we know is that our gifts are transformed, even our small gifts. With your help, disciples congregations across the U.S. and Canada are able to feed their neighbors and meet the needs of their communities right now. And our Week of Compassion partners around the world can meet the needs of this present moment while also looking ahead and planning for the future. Did you know that Foothills Christian Church is one of the top 100 giving congregations to Week of Compassion in the whole denomination? I'm so proud of that, and I'm always like, I know them. And because of your support, more communities now can access clean water. More people can wash their hands to prevent the spread of disease. More families can feed their children. And plan for a future with a sustainable food source. Because even the smallest gifts, when rooted in your faith and grown in compassion, yield an abundance beyond our wildest dreams. With God, all things are possible. Our combined gifts reach around the world from our doorsteps to the ends of the earth. Thank you for giving to Week of Compassion. Love you and miss y'all. Thank you so much for your generous gifts. They support the mission and ministry of our church, and we are so grateful for them. Um, this week, um, I encourage you to give both to our special offering for Week of Compassion through the COVID relief and to our general offering that supports the life of our church. Um, you can do both in multiple ways and um, go back if you didn't catch all of that information from earlier. Um, things happening in the life of our church Today, right after church, um, our youth middle school and high schoolers will be meeting. The link for the Zoom is in the description box where you can find that. And, um, oh, so this whole month of August, today is the last day of August, and we've taken a break from our regular fellowship time after church. But starting next week, we're going to be picking that back up. So we look forward to having you join us for that next week. And if you are a guest, um, joining us for worship, we're so glad that you have. Um, please fill out a Connect card, and we'd be glad to help you discover more about our church. Here now, a final blessing. Oh God, your love for us is like a blazing wildfire that never stops, that is steadfast and always abundant and with us. May your fire purify us and cleanse us and give us a clear vision to be co-workers for liberation. Let us leave this time of worship knowing that the love of God, the peace of Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is with us now and always. Amen. God.